All right, welcome everybody. We'll get uh, started here. Uh, we will in a few minutes get to Luke 5, where we're going to look at a couple more of the scenes from Jesus' life, in particular him uh, seeking out and, and uh, talking to his disciples, uh, and then also the wedding at Cana that we have in Luke 5 and in John 1. And so we'll look at those tonight here in just a few minutes. We are going to look back and at some of the scenes we've already looked at and ask just some um, some questions about maybe some things we could apply from that. Maybe look at some contemporary ideas that might, uh, that these might apply to uh, and have a discussion about that and then we'll continue on. Um, I'm, I am disappointed in the number of people that I was able to steal from Brent's class. It seems like it wasn't that many. Uh, so I'm going to keep working on it. I am going to offer a referral fee now. So if you were able to steal anyone from there, you'll also get uh, compensated, just so you know. This is important to me. So we're going to fill this room up. Uh, but the goal, once again, for us here is to look at these, these stories of Jesus and look from the perspective of, we're not going to, we're not going to look at everything that happens necessarily and, and go into every detail, but we do want to look at these different scenes from Jesus' life and try to understand his decision-making process uh, as a human being and uh, how he interacted with people, how he made decisions. Uh, and then these are things we can take from that and try to apply to different scenarios. So are we, this is, we're good now? I think this thing doesn't work, so you'll get the picture. Um, okay, let's have a prayer and then we'll begin. Let's bow. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful to you for all the blessings we have. We're thankful for this time that we can be together and that we can study your word together. We're thankful that you have let us know your will and that you have shown us the life of Jesus. And we ask that you would help us to be motivated to be like him. We ask that you would help us in our everyday lives to, to seek to fulfill your goals for us, that you would help us to do your will, that you would help us to be humble servants. We are thankful for your son, Jesus Christ. We're thankful for his sacrifice. We're thankful that he came and that he died and was buried and resurrected. We're thankful that he lives with you. And we know that we are able to pray through him and that he mediates for us. And it is because of his experience and that he was like us. And we pray all these things through him. And amen. Okay, so we've looked at a few different scenes of Jesus' life. Um, we started really with uh, the story of him when he was in the temple and he was uh, studying with the men in the temple. And it said that he was asking questions and had stayed behind when his parents traveled. And a few of the questions we asked about that, you know, it's, it's an interesting scene for us to see about Jesus, that it's, uh, we don't see a lot of uh, doctrinal teaching in that story. That's not a story we see where he's, we see what questions he, wouldn't it be great if we knew what questions he asked and what the answers were? Uh, but that's not what this is. This is a scenario in which we just see Jesus, that he was there after his parents left, and the interaction with him. And then we see how he interacts with his parents, and then the end of it is kind of this warm, touching thing about uh, Mary. And it just says that she just kept all these things in her heart, that it, there's this idea that this was something, this was a special thing. But I asked some questions, just some general questions, and we won't take too much time with this, but I just thought there may be some things that we would engage in where this scenario might come into play. And this is a difficult one, but I thought about one thing, which is uh, the idea that uh, Jesus stayed behind in the temple and asked questions and interacted with the teachers there while his entire caravan left for days. And... This is a scenario in which he chose to do this thing, but the other option wasn't a bad thing. It was a good, it was probably something he should have done or could have done. It wasn't like he did wrong. But I did ask the question, I, I posed this to you last time, you know, what, how do we handle something when we're faced with the choice between two good things? Does that ever happen? Even spiritual things. I think it's particularly in our, in our uh, community, there may be a situation in which we have to choose between two things that are good. How do we make that decision? What's the thought process there? Here's some, here's, go ahead, please. Okay, 
Okay. So first, I think maybe what you're saying is we need to look at the things that, you know, for the best, the best of our ability, we're confident that this is the right thing, that we're, we're looking at this, and we think this is just the better thing, or this is the, so it may just be that we have a confidence in it. Other thoughts? Yes. Okay, so it could be that maybe these are two good things and maybe not doing one could cause harm or doing, so it may be that we have to be cautious about that, about that selection. Now, I will say, this is no knock of course, but Jesus didn't seem, you know, he didn't seem to have a lot of caution here. He just did it because he, this is what he knew was right and he, he could have sent a note maybe, you know, let his parents know, hey, if you see my parents, let them know where I am. We don't know why that didn't happen. But we do need to handle the situations with caution. I, I thought about this a little bit, and I thought about, you know, even in a scenario, a secular scenario, I've thought about, uh, this hasn't happened to me a lot, but I've had situations where I was trying to choose between two job opportunities. And I went around in circles about, man, which one of these is the right choice you know, you know, okay, you know, if, if I do this one, it's a longer drive, maybe it's more hours, but it's more money and better benefits. This other one here, maybe it's a better upside. If, you know, I, you've probably been through things like that. And I'll just go around in circles. And if, you've, if you're like me, I have, I wish I still had them, but I've had them before where you have the two columns you write down, you know, this one's better because of this, and you write in these big columns. And I remember one year I was doing that, and I was just going around and around, and it just struck me finally that this answer does not exist, that I thought in my head for some reason, and I'm not trying to tell you how to think about the construct of the universe here, but in my head I used to think that the future is out there already and I'm just going to discover it. That I thought, I, if I choose one job or the other, if I choose the wrong one, well then I've chosen this path and the end of that path is disaster. But if I choose this other job, then that's where I'm gonna, you know, it's gonna be the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And I would just go around, and it struck me, that's not how the universe works. That I'm not, now, once again, I can't tell you how to think about it, but it helped me immensely that I decided I'm gonna choose the one that I feel best about, and I'm gonna make it good. And I'm gonna spend the rest of my life making this good, rather than trying to figure out what um, already established path there is for me in the future. So I just say, one thing I would mention to you is we certainly shouldn't get tied up, Jesus didn't get tied up with the decision-making process between, between these two good things. We also should not um, let prohibitive guilt get us. And I think there are people in this room who know exactly what that is, uh, that uh, there are people that are um, sometimes, you know, unable to make a decision because they feel guilty about every decision they make. I won't make you raise your hand, but there are people sitting in this room right now that I am quite confident have trouble making decisions because you feel guilty about everything. That is, does not seem to be the way Jesus was. He was working hard to be proactive and make good decisions, but he did not get tied up and hesitate because he was, was nervous about that. Uh, the other, and the other thing I would say is, when we're trying to decide between two good things, there's just prioritization that sometimes we have to make. Sometimes you just have to look at, remember we said, and we looked at the scenario in which Jesus was uh, with Mary and Martha, and uh, there was a priority decision to be made. And I would say, also look for the idea of a unique opportunity. Jesus made this decision because it was a unique opportunity for him, and he needed to do that and he was going to get back home one way or the other, but he decided, I'm taking advantage of this while I can. So I just wanted to, that's, that, I thought that was interesting. Neil, please. Don't you think the next year his parents took a, yeah. Kept on yeah, one of those things where they, yeah, where they really watched. Yeah, it could have been. I mean, that, I think that uh, it did change probably that, and, uh, but it worked out okay. Other thoughts about this in particular, about just this idea when we have to make those choices. I think, think sometimes we have these basic ones where it's like, it always, and I didn't, I was uh, avoiding mentioning this, but a lot of times it's, uh, there's something that's good to do, but it means we have to miss church. That's the one that I think comes up the most often. And sometimes there may be priorities that are above coming to church. That's, and I would say that those are things we have to be very careful about, but we have to look at everything and say, what is the, what's the best decision we can make in this scenario? Yes.
Yeah. Yeah, this was a... Yeah. Yeah, I was married at 20, so yeah. 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 So 12, maybe. We look at 12 like a little kid was running around, but it was a, it was a mature kid. Kenny? Yeah. Look, when I was young and stupid, I was young and stupid. Yeah. I made some really stupid choices. And thank goodness for it. Yeah, yeah. I, I dated the wrong girl. I did all the stuff I shouldn't have done. And I, I can't tell you what a better Christian that made me because it makes me appreciate what I've done. Yeah, and you just kind of, you kind of paraphrased uh, James 1 there a little bit. It's like this idea that making mistakes and going through these things is part of the maturing process. And um, I, my kids, I've got four kids, for those of you who don't know, and, and you know, a lot of you who have kids, you, you are trying to make sure they don't make any mistakes. And so sometimes you shelter them or you keep them out of situations where they need to, uh, to learn something, and it's not good for them. Sometimes, you know, of course, their safety and you know, the spirituality is the most important thing, but sometimes they're going to make mistakes and it's not bad for them. Yes. And our ability, which, and so if you didn't hear what he said, that some, we have this ego that says, oh, all of my decision-making decides the future, and it, and, it, and it will decide how God's future goes. Well, the reality is that right now, there, the, the future hasn't happened yet, and we're going to make these choices, and we're going to make them good according to God's will. And so the, we, we look that God can control things no matter what. So anyway, I didn't mean to, that one I liked, I just thought we'd talk about it a minute. I thought there's another part of this too, maybe slightly related, that, you know, what do we do when other people aren't as vigilant about spiritual things as we are? Uh, you know, I, I think about this story, and I think there wasn't a scene in which Jesus said, let me ask you something, mom and dad, why weren't you in the temple asking questions? There was a, this beautiful opportunity uh, why did y'all leave when there's all this good stuff we can do? And, and the story of... of uh, the poor will be with us always, you know, that this idea when Jesus said, we don't need to sell this, this expensive perfume, uh, just deal with what we have right here. And so it's this scenario in which there's a, sometimes a danger of us judging the, the vigilance of spirituality. And, and I think historically even about young Christians, when we have a person who is a new Christian and those of us who've been Christians for 20 years might expect them to immediately become a titan of faith and have this great depth of understanding of Scripture. And, you know, I, I have seen scenarios, more than one, where uh, a new Christian is baptized and some Wednesday night we don't see them, and I overhear somebody kind of getting on their case pretty good. And I'm not trying to diminish in any way coming to our assemblies, but it's just a scenario in which that person was made to feel foolish because they weren't as vigilant, perhaps, and it was a negative experience for them. And I think that Jesus demonstrated here that he's going to do the right thing. Everyone should do the right thing, but he is not going to uh, be uh, abusive or judgmental of people who maybe aren't doing, handling things the exact same way that he did. Um, so other questions. We know that in the next scene we studied, Jesus went and was baptized and, and with John the Baptist. And we know that uh, he was a not, in, not in need of remission of sins. He was a not in need of that cleansing, but he went and did it anyway. And so you might ask yourself, what is our responsibility of how we engage with people that maybe are not in our exact circle, our exact clique, or maybe not even in our comfort zone? That Jesus did not align himself with the most religious people in the world. That's not who he aligned himself with. Who did he align himself with? Fishermen. What did, what did the Pharisees call the people that he aligned himself with? Sinners. Sinners. Um, in fact, that's going to come up in our, in our scenario tonight. That's the, the, the scenario you're thinking of right now is the one in, our, in the scenario we're studying tonight. But Jesus <clears throat> aligned himself with regular people. people he, he lowered himself and did not consider himself in the upper crust of religious society. He was a regular guy from Nazareth had a rural living, <clears throat> had a uh, manual labor job, <clears throat> and he, those were his people. 
And so I think it's important for us to see, you know, most certainly we should be, you know, this is in Temple Terrace, Florida. We live in, I'm not, I'm not sure, I'm not saying everyone lives in Temple Terrace, but it's this middle class neighborhood, this, this little city. Sometimes we can start getting this image in our head that what Christians are is middle class, educated, buttoned up Americans. That, that, you know, we can get this idea that that's the kind of the, the stereotype or the, the picture of what a Christian is, that it's this, uh, these people that, are, that look like this, like we're sitting here dressed nice and quietly uh, listening to some guy talk about the Bible. But in reality, you know, I even think sometimes we, look, we think about when we do evangelism and, we, and, with, and someone goes to Romania or Italy, and we almost think, oh, we're going to those lowly people in Romania and helping, them, helping those people understand the Bible. I'm going to tell you, there are some um, people we can learn a lot from spiritually in Romania and Italy and, and that, are, that don't speak a word of English. We have just, I, I just wanted to make the point that we have got to have this humble understanding that uh, Jesus aligned himself with lowly people. He said the gospel is for the poor. Those are the people that are most in need and most in, in um, seeking salvation. Um, and then about, we talked about Jesus in his uh, temptation. And I, one of the questions I posed was, uh, what do we do when we are maybe nervous about a big challenge we see coming up in our lives, or we see something coming up that's gonna require a lot of us, what do we do when that's coming up? What did Jesus do? Prayed. Prayed. What else did he do? Yeah, that, that was how he handled the situation. What did he do before he even interacted with the devil? Yeah, he, 40 days in the wilderness of fasting, and I would just say, there is this, uh, there is an argument to be made that Christians are overprepared people, that the, we are not people who fly by the seat of our pants. We are people that prepare, and particularly when there's a spiritual challenge or a life challenge, we do what it takes to make sure our mind is right, to make sure we uh, are emotionally prepared. Jesus did that when he went into that extremely challenging scenario. The other one I just at least, we touched on it last time that I wanted to mention is that Jesus was offered um, a lot of things in these temptations, you know, some bread that he was, he was starving and offered some, uh, have some bread or I'll give you all of the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus was having none of it. He knew that he was being offered um, a get rich quick scheme that and I think there, that I think that there's a lesson to be learned there that Jesus was not being swayed by propaganda or persuasive pitches. Um, that, you know, their salesmanship is a great skill, and the goal is to get somebody to buy your product, and in many cases it is, it is to figure out what you can tell people so that, they'll, uh, so that they'll pull out their wallet and give you money. And sometimes that requires a great deal of maybe even deceptive persuasion, but it, Jesus was having none of it. He established his principles, he heard what the devil had to offer, and he was not going to fall for it, and he, was not gonna, he was, wasn't going to give an inch in that. And so I think even for us, <clears throat> take time to think, take time to consider, know what our basic principles are. And Jesus showed all these things in these scenarios in which he wasn't necessarily up preaching on the side of a mountain. He was just living and demonstrating these principles. Okay, any other comments just about how it is that in these scenarios that we might learn to improve our own decision making? Okay, turn to Luke 5 if you would. We're going to look tonight, uh, we're going to touch on a couple of scenarios in which Jesus, uh, after his temptation, uh, met and selected his disciples, and then the wedding at Cana that we have recorded. I worked really hard, I want you to know, to try to understand Luke 4, Luke 5, and the wedding at Cana and what order they're in. I failed at, at this. And if so if there's anybody in this room who has a great scholarly knowledge of Luke 4, if you, if, if you look back, remember we, we were in Luke 4 and there was the temptation, but then between what we read in the temptation and what we're about to read in Luke 5, uh, there was, when Jesus went into the temple and read from Isaiah, you remember? Um, 
There were, uh, was a man that was possessed with an evil spirit in Capernaum. There is the uh, story of him healing all the people that came to him, and he was starting to have crowds come after him. I think there's confusion sometimes because when we read the wedding at Cana, what's one of the first things it says when we read the story of the wedding at Cana? It says this is the first, this is the first sign that Jesus did. And so if you look in Luke 4 and see him, you see these signs he did, I don't know. Does anybody in here have some great depth of knowledge about that? I'm not, I'm asking genuinely. So I, I don't know. I know that, uh, that these things in Luke 4 happened, and I know these things in Luke 5 happened, and then we're also going to look at um, John 1, but I don't, know, I don't know the exact order, and so uh, I feel like that maybe it doesn't matter too much. So whatever happened, when we look in Luke 5, we see that there was a crowd pressing around him and listening to the Word of God. So whatever he had done between, you know, obviously what happened at his baptism that might have caused people to perk up their ears. Yeah, I mean, a, a dove came down and landed on him, and a voice from heaven said, this is my son. We also have um, when, uh, when he saw John the Baptist, John the Baptist said, what about him? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So he was getting attention. But it seems in Luke 5 that there now is a crowd of people. It says that there's a lot of people coming and following him around. And it says he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, or the Sea of Galilee, and he saw two, ba- uh, saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put it out a little distance from the land. And he sat down and continued teaching the crowds from the boat. So this is, you know, he was trying, these people were listening. It says they were listening to the word of God, and he was having trouble teaching them. They were crowded, it says they were pressing in around him and he was trying to teach them, but he was having trouble. He comes up upon people with boats that um, had had a failed day of fishing, clearly, and that they were out packing up. And he asks to use one of the boats for for the practical purpose of being able, the people being able to hear him talk. And he used the boat and it says continued uh, teaching. And it says, now when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out under the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon responded and said, master, we have worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. And when he had done this, they caught a great quantity of fish and their nets began to tear. And they signaled their partners uh, in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats to the point that they were sinking. So now, I, I, part of this to me almost seems like Jesus was uh, compensating Peter for the use of his boat. I don't, I'm, and I'm not trying to belittle it. it, it I believe there is, there is a value here in him. This is, here is another, by the way, sign that he performed that uh, perhaps was before the wedding at Cana. Um, but this is clearly a very powerful sign that he performed, and we know there were people around. But it may have just been that he got to use Simon's boat, and he said, hey, I'll help you out here. But this was such an amazing thing. You can see the reaction that the people had. The first reaction was from Peter. And what was Peter's immediate reaction to what just happened? He he says, he fell down on his knees saying, get away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. Why was that his reaction in this scenario? Why would this, I mean, clearly it's a good thing for him. He makes his living by catching fish and he's just had the mother load. But why was this his reaction? Yeah, it, it, it hit him like a ton of bricks. It's like it really struck him. And, I, and it was interesting in studying these again that sometimes I think we have the perception that he wandered up on these people fishing and it was the first time he had seen them and he said, follow me. But there was clearly a knowledge. They, they, in fact, when we look in the, uh, we'll look in just a minute in John, and it was clear that he had, he had seen them around and that they'd interacted before. But <clears throat> perhaps Peter, just it had not hit him yet. But when he saw this, there was no excuse. He just said, you know, he's not doubting. He's not questioning. He's not making, he just says, I, I can't even be in your presence. I don't even deserve to be in your presence. You were so, so powerful. 
and I am a sinful man. It says in verse 9, For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. This, you know, I, don't, I think probably we use the word amazing so much in America that we don't translate this quite right, but it says they were seized with amazement. And it, I see this as a jaw-dropping, chill up your spine, just, you know, absolute knock you over type of scenario. So when we, because we overuse amazing, I think we don't realize that their amazement was they were bowled over by this. And it says, clearly the, the partners that he had, it says, were James and John, the sons of Debedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not fear, for now on you will be catching people. And when he had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. I, um, I'll just touch real quick on John 1. You can turn there if you want, but I just want to just quickly touch on John 1, where we see Jesus interacting with uh, people again. And this, this is where in John 1 and verse 35, it says that John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And it says um, in verse 39, he said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, and it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah. And so this is also telling us a little bit how Andrew saw it first, went to Peter and said, I've seen the Messiah. He saw what happened with John the Baptist, and he went to him. And then in verse 43, the next day, he decided to go to Galilee and found Philip, and Jesus said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew. Uh, this is a famous line. If you ever want to know who said the extremely famous line, can any good thing come from Nazareth? It is Nathaniel, uh, and uh, the idea that, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, it's, it's kind of a rude thing, I would just say. I mean, it's one of those things where you're just like, hey, come on. You know, I think he's almost, I think his amazement is almost that they're saying the Messiah came from Nazareth, that, that he couldn't connect those things. But the same thing was said to him. Uh, Jesus tells him that he saw him, uh, that he had seen him sitting under the fig tree and studying, and then in verse 50, Jesus answered and said to him, because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And so I just wanted to touch on that there to see another scenario in which he, uh, Andrew became involved, Philip, Nathaniel, that we have these, these other people that he has reached out to and made part of his plan. And so we don't, we don't have a ton of time left tonight, and so we'll, we'll finish this up next time. But I wanted to ask you this question, and I'd like you to just be honest. If you were about to take on the greatest mission in the history of the world, and you um, needed to put together a team to do that, clean the slate right now, who would you select? If you, have, if you have got to accomplish the purpose that Jesus is beginning here in his mission in teaching God's word to the world, what kind of a team would you put together? The people of the day. Okay, and they were there, weren't they? They were, they were there. So you might say, how about the Bible scholars? We might first go, because there were people there that were um, old scholars of the old law. So maybe we'd say those people. Who else might you select? Yes, please. Jack. Yeah, there was some intelligence behind the selection of these people that, that God had a plan for who needed to be part of this. And he did not select who we might select. Like I said, you know, so one might be that we select uh, religious leaders and scholars. Who else might you say would be really good for that? Yes. 
Okay? So, so someone who is zealous, someone who's very, you know, interested in zealous, yeah, I think that, that we've, we would see that as valuable, I think. Other thoughts? Yeah, Kenny? I think definitely if it's politically collected, uh, the, the ones who have a lot of connections, the people who have a lot of money. Yes. I mean, the, the, the point you're going to make is we chose a lot of losers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't appreciate you skipping to my point, but that's fine. Uh, but you you brought up a couple other things. There's like we got want zealous people, hard workers. We want people who are experts in the law. We want people who have money. I'm going to tell you, anytime people start up something like this, they want to find the people who can fund it, and you want to find the people who have connections. That you know, man, that's useful. To, you know, can we get in? You know, get some favors. He absolutely didn't do any of that. And, and we know, like what Jack said, that you know, this was God's plan for who would do this. But he selected fishermen and a tax collector and people who just did you know, very menial type things, or we might call blue collar, or people who were outcasts of society. Why? One, one we already know that God had made these selections. So why would these people be particularly useful in this mission. Yes? It has to be somebody who's willing to make the sacrifice. It has to be somebody who's willing to do what it takes and know that that they're willing to drop everything. And I would say that certainly we talk about people with money and that are established and that are connected. And these are people least likely to drop everything and sacrifice everything and go with them. Yes. Yeah. This is not a team that wins. This team loses every time except God. Except that the counterintuitive plan of God that and so one one is that they were willing to make the sacrifice that they were that the the team was uh, very specifically um, compatible with this mission. Um, what about who they were going to be uh, evangelizing to? He was saying, "You're going to be catchers of men." Who is it that they were going to be teaching to, most likely? <laughs> yeah, it, that, he selected the people who would connect with the community he's teaching to, the people who were in need, the people who were helpless, the people seeking. Um, we see how he interacted with the religious leaders. We see how well he uh, was able to collaborate with the religious leaders. They rejected him in every way. They were threatened by him. But he took people who were willing who believed, were willing to uh, step into an extremely difficult task and see it through, and that he knew the audience. I think that, once again, when, because we are Americans, it's hard for us to recognize that Jesus was seeking the lowly, that he was seeking the poor and the disenfranchised, the people who were outcasts of society, that's who he sought. And so the team he put together clearly was designed to be effective in that scenario. Um, Jesus, and so let's, I think maybe just before we're done, let's look at verse 27 in Luke 5, because it kind of tells a little bit more about where Jesus' head was at. 
It says, uh, he went out and looked in verse 27 and looked at a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax office and he said to him, follow me. And he left everything behind and got up and began following him. And Levi became, uh, gave a big reception in his house and there was a large crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with him. The Pharisees and the scribes began grumbling to his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus said, answered and said to them, it is not those who are healthy that need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. So there's a simplicity to Jesus' answer here. He, he clearly selected uh, who he felt was, you know, and, and that God directed him would be the most effective in this mission. One of those was a tax collector, a, a despised member of society. Uh, and as they sat around the table, they were basically being reprimanded. Yes, Daryl. Yeah, and if you couldn't hear her, she, I, she helped fill in the gap here. About why is it the tax collectors were so despised? And she pointed out, first of all, they're connected to the Roman Empire. That's the taxes they're collecting, uh, the, the thing that people most want to give to. And they skimmed. They benefited financially from that. And so they were just considered, uh, I, sh I, I hesitate to give examples of jobs in our current society that are looked at like this, in case there are people in the room who have those jobs. But I would just say there are people who their job is just not appreciated much. Yes? She chose those because they were reachable, teachable, and willing. She, uh, she's poetic again. She said reachable, and they're teachable and willing. These were selected for that, and that's a really way, good way of putting it. They were accessible, uh, they were willing to learn, and they, first, and they were hardworking. They were, they were willing to do the work. Yes, sir? It could be, and I think, and in fact, we, we can't pick apart exactly what he says because the point is clear. He is, he is out teaching the people who are in most need, that he's saying there are sick people out there that are helpless, they are dying, and I'm going to go to them, and I'm going to show love to them, and I'm going to teach them. And the impression we get is that they, were, they received it warmly, and so that, that idea that says, this is who I'm here to talk to. I think we, uh, once again, I, I don't, I'm not railing on Americans here, but I just know I'm, I'm an American and I have, um, you know, I sometimes am ungrateful about how good I have it. And I would say that you take a person who grew up like me, middle class, uh, that's sometimes a person who doesn't see the need it's a person who doesn't have as much pain and does not endure as much discomfort and is not as desperate. Um, and so the fact that there are people that are already disenfranchised and, and struggling and living lives maybe of agony, those are people seeking a savior. Those are people that are needing a Messiah to save them. And even though we all need it, like, you know, like what Don said, we all need a savior there are some people who are grappling for one more desperately because they, they have nothing or they, or they don't know where else to go. Uh, we'll talk next time a little bit more about this idea that because certainly when we uh, look at the wedding at Cana, there's this picture that Jesus was just a common person. He interacted with the common people. He wasn't, even in the story we read about when he was 12, he wasn't hobnobbing with the upper crust of religious society. He was asking questions to the people who were scholars of the law. He, he gravitated to common people. And when he talked about his gospel, he said the gospel is for the poor. The gospel is salvation. And so you have to find people that believe they are lost 
and that see the darkness and that see that they're lost. So Jesus says that. He says, I've come to, not to call the righteous but uh, to repentance but sinners. And he's almost just pointing out the um, ridiculousness of the idea. He, I, I feel like there's, because I do believe he was, from, from reading what he says, he was a clever person. And I believe he was trying to be clever here a little bit, saying, um, so you felt like I should go and try to convert the righteous people then. Is that what you're saying? Um, I'm sure he wasn't as, as sarcastic as that. But I think he's almost saying here, you're asking why I'm here with the people you consider to be sinners and tax collectors. Well, because I'm here to save those people. I'm, I'm not going out and seeking the people who were already saved, whoever they may be. And so this, the story of him choosing the disciples, the, the fishermen cleaning their nets, Levi, the, uh, the tax collector, you know, maybe the most hated job in society. Uh, what we see with Philip and Nathaniel, he was clearly seeking people that were, and, and we should mention, Jesus fell into this category of common person as well. That, that's what Nathaniel said when he heard about the Messiah coming from Nazareth is, Messiahs don't come from Nazareth. That's not where, that's not where Messiahs are made. They're made in Jerusalem. That's where messiahs are made. They're made, uh, if we're going to, and uh, I think uh, Kenny re re uh, referenced this, if we're going to overthrow the Roman military, um, this guy is not, the right, is not the right type. So we'll talk more about this next time, and I'd like you to think a little bit more. We're definitely going to talk more about the gospel and the message of Jesus and who he selected and even in the story that we read in the wedding at Cana about Jesus caring about common things and common people and everyday things, even some of the things that we have recorded in the miracles he performed and the signs he performed, some of them as you reread them, you find out it wasn't even intended to be a sign. It was Jesus taking care of a need that was in his presence or having compassion on a person and wanting to take care of them seeing a person that was struggling. Jesus clearly had a compassion and a heart for people who had lives of desperation and pain. That's who he was trying. That's, that's what a savior is for. And so then we're going to continue that next time. Well, so we'll continue this conversation about why Jesus selected these people by God's direction. And then when we look at the next scenario in which he was at a wedding, I want to look at that because it was almost just a little scene of Jesus doing a regular thing before he uh, performed this miracle. Um, that he went to a wedding. He went to funerals. He went to weddings. He, he went to parties. He, he did these things. He, he hung out with friends. And sometimes in those scenarios, there was a need that he was able to fill. And so we'll talk about that next time. I appreciate y'all's input tonight. We'll look forward to seeing you again on Wednesday.